It is fair to point out that the sheer number of stops and searches has decreased dramatically in the past six months or so, and that the geographical areas covered by Section 44 authorizations have been reduced considerably. Nevertheless, the fact remains that the power given by Section 44 has caused and continues to cause a disproportionately bad effect on community relations, with the often inaccurate but genuinely felt belief that it is used in a discriminatory way. It has certainly been used in some instances without reason, let alone suspicion. Perhaps most significant is that it has now been held unlawful by the European Court of Human Rights. The government has asked for permission to appeal, but even if permission is given, and it's quite a big if, um, the, court, the appeal is far from certain of success. We must work on the assumption that the decision will be affirmed and that Section 44 will be held unlawful. Unpalatable though it can be to find that our hallowed domestic jurisdictions can now find themselves overruled by international courts of sometimes variable judicial quality, that is where we are. I would suggest that there needs to be a political accommodation now between all parties for the repeal of Section 44 in its present form and for its replacement early in the new Parliament by a much restricted power made compatible with the European Convention. That power should be designed, and is needed, to allow the police to deal quickly and practically with three situations. First, critical terrorism incidents, such as when searches and or arrests are taking place under other powers of the Terrorism Act 2000. Second, a necessarily closed, that is to say secret list, of premises properly designated as critical national infrastructure. And third, truly iconic events at which the risk of terrorist crime is assessed as at least severe. If the law were changed in that way, it would be reasonable to expect a considerable increase in the use of Section 43 on suspicion. However, that test of suspicion is more familiar to police officers, more accountable, more capable of testing in court, and more acceptable to the public. If the parties cannot agree on a shared agenda for counter-terrorism, each of them, and the interested NGOs, will be failing in a duty that, in my view, they owe to the public and to the Parliament to do more than merely oppose. In passing, I would add, too, that they owe a duty to avoid what I call the pragmatic incrementalism that has been the driver of some legislative changes, often shorthanded as something must be done. They also owe a duty to tidy up the parliamentary scrutiny of the intelligence services. I accept that parliamentary scrutiny cannot be completely transparent, but it can be completely accountable. And I believe that the establishment of a subcommittee of vetted senior privy councillors of the Intelligence Services Committee would provide that level of accountability, because they would be able to see everything. At the very least, those who govern us and lobby government possess a duty to set out a comprehensive template of their approach to the protection of national security, that aggregate of freedoms, of individual freedoms I referred to earlier. Nothing less will do. By the same token, if any NGO thinks that they need no, do no more than act as the gadfly on these issues, in my view, they should think again. John Creamy and people like John Creamy have risked their careers and even their lives in the careful, honourable and objective prosecution and defence of terrorism suspects and in the pursuit of better law. John Creamy stands as a symbol, but many are not major figures like John Creamy. They are the civil servants who put policy into effect, the border officers who stand at passport and custom posts, and the police constables who stand in the front line. 